All right, we're going to come to a time of prayer now, and as, as we get into this time of prayer, uh, let's make this a time of reflection, a time um, as we prepare for the Lord's Supper to look into our hearts and uh, ask God to just forgive those things that we need forgiven today. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, and uh, just thank you for this time of worship. I thank you for um, this community that we can come together and um, recognize who you are. And we thank you for that, what we just sang in that last song, Cornerstone, um, that you are our foundation. You are the, the piece of, the, of our whole life that holds it all together. And, and so I just pray that as we come to this time where we get to reflect on what you've done for us, who you are in our lives, that you would just um, prepare our hearts for what you have to say, prepare our hearts for what you have to show us, and make sure that we are cleansed and we are ready to step before you um, and with arms open wide as we uh, just recognize what you did for us as we um, come together and celebrate that as a church family. I pray um, that the rest of this service, you would speak through the music, you would speak through what you say through Tyler, you would speak through this time. In your name I pray. Amen. Good. Good morning. Today we are doing, uh, we're, we're taking the Lord's Supper. And uh, most of the time when we do this, we dedicate the entire service uh, to this. Um, it's going to be a little different. We've never done it like this before, but um, basically I've got some people lined up to walk us through as, uh, as Jesus stands trial, as he's crucified, and uh, we, we hear the story of the passion. Um, but the goal of today is to remember... Jesus said to do this in remembrance of me. So we want to remember and see Jesus for who, who he is and for what he's done. Um, it, it can be difficult to see Jesus in the brokenness of, of our world, uh, whether it's our own brokenness or just the circumstances or difficulties we face in life. Uh, it can be easy to lose sight of Jesus, to really remember him as, as, as he is. And not let things in our lives get bigger and in the way of, of seeing Jesus. Uh, I've spent, y'all hear me talk about the mountains all the time. I'm sorry, I'm addicted. Uh, I need to go back. Uh, but I've spent a lot of time backpacking and in the mountains. And, and let me tell you, it's a different thing to pull off on the side of the road from a scenic overlook and admire from the side what a mountain looks like. Uh, it's, it's easy. You just drive up there, you pull off. Um, you know, to, to admire those great peaks. It's another thing to have toiled and to walk 20 plus miles and to summit a, a 13, 14,000 foot peak and stand at the top and gain a little different perspective. You're not looking at from the side, you're looking from the top down and around and, and something that few people get to see. Uh, the majority of our lives are either spent climbing out of valleys or climbing peaks or approaching the time at the top where, where you stand at the top and you're able to look around and see clearly is brief. And when you're there, you're exhausted. It took a lot to get to where you are. Today is not about us, though. As we read this story today, Jesus is climbing Mount Calvary. And my goal for us today is to walk beside him to even hear the sound of the cross dragging the ground as he drags it up with his broken body uh, and to see and to remember Jesus as he is, to see him lifted up, to even think what was his perspective from the cross as he looked down upon the people who were watching him die and give himself. Uh, so you all join me in prayer this morning and Crystal's going to come up and start us off. Lord, I pray, um, Samuel prayed to speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Help us to see, help us to remember, 
Help us to know you for who you really are and not for who we want you to be. Help us not to be safe people. Help us to abandon ourselves and and live the radical life that you've called us to because you uh, were radical. You you chased after people. You went to the extremes. And, and Lord, help us to see you for who you are today. We pray this in your name. Hi, everybody. (laughs) Okay, I'm reading John 19, 1 through 7. Pilate then took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and put a purple robe on him. And they began to come up to him and say, Hail, King of the Jews, and and to give him slaps in the face. Pilate came out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Jesus then came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold, the man. So when the chief priest and the officer saw him, they cried out saying, Crucify, crucify. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by that law he ought to die, because he made himself out to be the son of God. So, all the drama of this story, can you imagine the Son of God, as we know him now, after the resurrection, standing trial unjustly, he hadn't done anything wrong. Imagine your best friend, your brother, your sister, uh, being accused of something and just being slapped in the face. Imagine someone fashioning a a crown of thorns and twisting it onto their head, insulting them, throwing a robe around them when they had done nothing wrong. All these things come out in the story. Hail the king of the Jews, as is said, in such a degrading way. They were insulting him. But one thing jumped out to me as I read this story uh, more than before. And that's what Pilate said. He said, behold the man. And I didn't know why, but as I was reading through my study Bible, I glanced over at the footnote and it said, this is a natural way for Pilate to introduce someone who's accused of something. But it's a providentially significant statement. Jesus is the last Adam. The one who sums up all that humanity could and should be. So in other words, if you're looking at the fullest experience of what it means to be human, you have to look and know Jesus. Pilate was speaking truth. Jesus is the ultimate picture of what it means to be truly human. So y'all help me out. What, what's something that, that we do as we relate to one another? What, what's an action that goes on between people? What? Hugs. Used to be hug. Jesus gave the perfect hugs, just if you were wondering. Yeah. The perfect high fives, perfect, perfect interaction between people. But what about the more complicated stuff? Did you all know that Jesus was perfectly angry? Raise your hand if you've ever been perfectly angry. Oh, okay, okay. There's, there's stories about people like you in the Bible. <laughs> He was perfectly angry. He was perfectly sad. He had perfect friendships. He had perfect communion with God. Uh, He had perfect laughter. I know that sounds ridiculous, but Jesus had the ultimate human experience. He had perfect grief, perfect relationships, perfect obedience, perfect unbroken communion with God. How many days... Can you go five minutes without thinking in a totally self-centered way? Jesus gave all of himself to the Father. And I don't want to make it, sometimes we can, we can think of Jesus as, well, you know, he was Jesus. Of course he could do all those things. But Hebrews chapter 4 says, 
For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize, to feel, to understand our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. It had to be this one, this perfect one, with perfect relationships, perfect unbroken communion with God. Perfect grief, perfect love, perfect sadness, perfect everything. The unblemished lamb that would answer for the sins of the world. The guilty traded for the innocent. That's the story of Christ. So talking about Jesus as the ultimate man, the second Adam. Adam is the only person created sinless. Jesus was born sinless. Nobody between them was sinless. Romans 5 says, Therefore, as one man's offense, when Adam sinned, the whole world became sinful. Just as through Adam's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so, through one man's righteous act, Jesus being lifted up, being crucified on the cross, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. This morning in our equipping hour, we talked about this conversation Jesus had with these people who were self-righteous. Let me tell you something. Those people who said they had perfect anger, I'm not talking to you. Uh, even if you think you're self-righteous, you especially, you're not. Okay. That, that's, you're, you're one of those people who says, uh, that Jesus says, that need no repentance, that think they need no repentance. So all of us in here, even the righteousness that we do have, guess what? It's not our own. It's been given to us. It is a gift. It's grace. It's only by the real man, Jesus, that we can have access to God. So today, let us remember and honor, what did Pilate say? Behold the man, to behold him, because there is only one who is perfect that could answer for the imperfect in such a humiliating way, out of perfect love for the Father and for you and me. Would you all stand, and uh, we're going to sing as our response to behold this morning.
his gift, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. John 19, 8 through 16. Therefore, when Pilate heard the statement, he was even more afraid. And he entered the praetorium again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, are you not speaking to me? Do you know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him. You would have no authority over me at all if it had not been given to you from above for this reason. The one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. As a result of this, Pilate made efforts to release him. But the Jews shouted, saying, If you release this man, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. Therefore, when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a table called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, look, your king. So they shouted, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king except Caesar. So he then handed him over to them to be crucified. Pilate missed Jesus' king because he had a job to do. He had position. He had people to please. The Jews, the religious leaders, cried out, crucify him because they hated Jesus. They loved their formal rules. They loved their traditions. Uh, they loved their positions of power more than they loved God and more than they loved their neighbors. They had a perfect idea of what it meant or what the Messiah was supposed to be. And guess what? Jesus didn't fit it. They rejected him. He didn't fit their agenda. They had built a God box, a box of what the Messiah was supposed to look like. And uh, Jesus was content to bust that little box into splinters and sawdust. You do that by being crucified. They wanted Jesus to fit their understanding of the Messiah and be on their side. You know, it's almost as, as immature as, as praying for God to be with the Texans, which would be a real prayer right now. Uh, they demanded that Jesus play on their team. But just like in the story of Joshua being approached uh, by the angel of the Lord, 
Joshua approaches uh, the angel of the Lord. He has a sword in hand, which is the pre-incarnate Christ, a lot of people think. And Joshua asks, whose side are you on? And you know what the angel of the Lord says? Neither, for I am the commander of the Lord's army. Guess what? Jesus is not on your side. He's on his own side. He reigns supreme as king. And these people, uh, the Jews, demanded that Jesus be on their side. Jesus doesn't need a side. He is his side. He is the only side. My question today is for this one that reigns supreme as king, are we aligning ourselves with him? Are we demanding that he line up with us and be on our team? Or to put it simply, are we seeing Jesus, King Jesus? Another thing, thing Pilate said providentially, behold your king. Are we seeing King Jesus as he is or as we want him to be? Uh, there's only one reality, and that's who he is.
John 19, verses 17 through 30. They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two other men, one on either side and Jesus in between. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus, the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, Do not write, the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts, a part to every soldier and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture, they divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore, the soldiers did these things. By standing, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus had saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Why don't we go ahead and open uh, the little cellophane up on the top there. This is one of my most unfavorite things about COVID is having to do the Lord's Supper like this. But What was finished? Jesus had accomplished everything that had been given to him. Um, I am planning on doing this, but if you haven't put a Bible in your hand today, grab your Bible, open up to Psalm chapter 22 with me. I remember reading this in college in a time where I was just really running from the Lord and basically asking God if he was real and thinking, who else could this have been talking about seven, six hundred years prior 
Psalm 22. Uh, Let's start in verse 10. Upon you I was cast from my birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. For there is none to help. Imagine Jesus as we read these things. There is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me. As a ravening and roaring lion, I am poured out like water. And all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaves to my jaws, and you lay me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I count all my bones. They look, they stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. You see, it was always the plan that Jesus be broken for us. That the Messiah be the one to come and be a broken king that would answer for his people in a way that no one else could. From the beginning of time, from the beginning of the life of Adam and Eve, you'll hear me talk about brokenness a lot more. Um, Brokenness exists. It is the human condition. Every single one of us um, are breaking down physically. Uh, There's contention in our relationships. There's problems. It's a human experience to be broken and in need of something. And the one who is complete, Jesus, was broken. The one who was whole was broken. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The transaction was the infinitely perfect king for the ones who were slaves to their own sin, who could not rescue themselves. So, Every time I preach, which is not really what I'm doing today, um, there's a lot that happens. Uh, But the most important thing that happens is that the Spirit speak to you. So today we've heard the story of the passion of Jesus being crucified, walking up Calvary, having nails driven through his hands and feet, having a crown of thorns twisted upon his head. The question is, what have you done with this king? What is he saying to you? Uh, The Bible says for us to inspect ourselves, to not take communion flippantly, without thinking, uh, with with unconfessed, unrepentant sin in our hearts. And uh, communion is just for believers, by the way. If you're not faithfully following Jesus, if you haven't repented and trusted in the story and the person that we've talked about today, this isn't for you. Um, For our kids that haven't made a profession of faith, uh, who haven't been baptized, this isn't for you. These are for for God's people to remember that this one who is perfect, loved perfectly, and gave perfectly. What's the gap between you and God right now? What is it? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. I want to give a few minutes. We've having a very quick service today. But I want to miss out on the opportunity for God to speak to you. So if you would, Joe, would you mind playing something and just give us some time to to dwell on our relationship with God and, and think on Jesus.
it is you're thinking about, would you commit that over to God? Would you repent? Would you turn from your ways and go God's way? Before Jesus was crucified, he sat with his disciples after he'd washed their feet. He instituted something that we call the Lord's Supper. And in Matthew 26, Jesus asked us to do this in remembrance of him. It says, while they were eating, Jesus took some bread And after blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Pray with me before we do this. Lord, help us not to take this in an unworthy manner, but to remember that you truly gave everything. That you gave your body to be bruised, to be broken, that you experienced real pain and real death. us to remember you well, to cherish you, to know you as Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen. Would you all take this with me? We'll go ahead and open the other one. Good luck not spilling that. As we take this today, remember that every drop of blood that Jesus spilled was not accidental, but intentional. That he had you and me in mind as he went to the cross. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. If you don't know reconciliation with God, if every night when your head hits the pillow, you have no peace, you have nothing but anxiety and discomfort and separation, you know something isn't right and you don't have a relationship with Christ, Jesus is waiting. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You have a loving father, a savior, a redeemer, and he's waiting for you. Would you all stand with me? We're going we're gonna to close um, singing an old hymn this morning. Jesus.
of Jesus. Uh, that's our goal when we do these services, is just to remember. It's not, not to fix anything, not to give you life advice. It's to put our eyes on Jesus. Jim, would you mind closing us out today? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we could once again remember the sacrifice that your Son made for us, that he's covered a multitude of sins, uh, even mine. Let us remember that throughout the week and the days to come so that we would uh, live lives pleasing to you and uh, witness to others through our lives and words. We ask in his name. Amen.